in the chat. All right, good evening. This is Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have a Bible, please turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. This will be a study over the book of Isaiah in the chapter number 53. Very, very famous passage of Scripture. I think many people are familiar with it. Uh, it starts off in the very beginning. Uh, Isaiah writes, Who hath believed our report? And if you actually think about that verse, you already know, if you've ever read any of Paul's epistles, he quotes that. You remember where he quotes that? He quotes it in Romans chapter number 10, right? And I think it's a, it's a good verse to look at, because if you look at Romans 10, he says, Who hath believed our, our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? What I think is so crazy about that verse is there's some interpretive liberty that Paul uses in the prophetic scriptures, right? It's almost like, well, he's using that, right? And he's using that verse, but it's, it's not necessarily about that, right? He's just gleaning what we consider to be a secondary principle from that particular message. That makes sense? So in this particular instance, who hath believed our report? Well, what is, what is the report about? We'll turn, turn to, to Romans 10 and read what he says. In, uh, look what he says in like, Romans chapter 10 and verse number uh, 6. He says, but the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. See, what he's stating is you're looking for answers. You want to know something, and yet you don't know where to look for it. You can't find the answer for it. So what she's saying is, is, well, say not in thine heart. Well, look, all we need to do is we just need to bring heaven. We need to bring Christ back down to get an answer to these questions that we have. What is this righteousness of faith? We need to ask Christ again what it is, right? We need to clarify it. And he says, or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. He says, no, no, no. What saith it? Notice this. What saith what? What saith it? What, what is the it that he's talking about? Well, it's the righteousness of faith, which is by what? by the scriptures, okay? And he says, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10 is a very specific passage, and it's in relation to the Jews, okay? He's, he's being very specific about who he's talking to, because he says, if you read in Romans chapter number 10, Brother, in verse one, my brother, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel for God. Brother, <laughs> brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So when he goes and hammers out all of Romans chapter ten, he's saying to the to the Israelite, look, look, if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, that's the most important problem that you have right now. You don't confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You do not believe him to be the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall believe in the heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now notice this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they, notice what he says, and, and how, how shall they uh, preach except they be sent, as is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good joy. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, notice, Lord, who hath believed our report? Well, isn't that some interpretative liberty there a little bit, right? I mean, we understand what he's saying here. He's saying in the beginning, who hath believed our report? He's just saying, in general, the report about the testimony of what's going to come next, who hath believed this report? He, he makes a statement, and it, it, I, we can get into these verses in Acts. Uh, we'll get into it in just a second, but I, I don't want to diverse too much. But the statement of who hath believed our report, the report is what? What is the report? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he's come. And he's come in the flesh. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And he says, to whom is the workings, the arm of the Lord is the workings of the Lord revealed. Who sees the work of God and what's actually being done? Well, we do. You know, to, to Paul, he says, I see it. I understand it. I know exactly what he's doing. Now, notice what he says in verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root of a dry ground. So what he's saying is he comes out, that is Jesus Christ comes out 
with no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Meaning, he's an average, everyday person, right? He doesn't look like some wow. And we, I go back to the story in Samuel about when Samuel picks out King David, right? You guys remember that? And they're, they're picking out the king, and they go, well, do you have any more sons? Do you have any more sons? Well, I have David. <laughs> you know, he's out there tending to the sheep. That little guy, right, into the eye, remember the verse says, God looketh on the, what, on the inward, man looketh on the outward, and so that appearance issue that man sees is not how God sees, and so he, he's proving that and using the weak things of the world to confound the wise. So this is a prime example of it, out of a dry ground, just out of, out of nothing. How, what do you mean, this, this, this guy comes out of Nazareth? What, is, what, is, what does Nathaniel say? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth, right? He's a Nazarene, yuck, right? Going on, he says, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, notice this, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. See, when he takes the Jews and he puts them into this position, it's this verse is really interesting where he says, smitten of God. See, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. They thought the punishment that they did to him on the cross, they did it through the law of Moses, through the you know Roman system. They said, he blasphemed the law of Moses, he is a blasphemer. He needs to die the death of a blasphemer. And as a result, we're going to put him on the cross and he's going to face the penalty for his, you know, for his transgression of, of claiming to be what? More, they all get mad about him in the Gospels. They always claim, to Matthew through John, they always claim, because he made himself out to be, or he made himself out to be equal with God. Remember those verses? So he goes on to say, yet we esteem him, we esteemed him in what way? Stricken, smitten of God. And afflicted. Look with me over at Matthew chapter number 8. Russ has been going over, and if you haven't listened to these sermons, I encourage you to do so. On our Suncoast Bible Fellowship YouTube page, uh, Russ has had two really great sermons on going through the Old Testament and going through really the completed Bible, and he's going to show you how the Bible is a self-authenticating book. Right? People always ask, well, how do you know the Bible's true? And this is a really important point, right? Most people try to do what to prove the Bible? They try to go outside the Bible to prove the Bible. And sure, there's some historical and educational things that you can learn from that, but I can assure you that if you're trying to establish faith in God, it must come from the Bible. Okay? The Bible is absolutely a self-authenticating book, and when Jesus Christ comes, they say, yeah, 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 but that's just what you say. He goes, no, no, no. He says, if I bear record of myself, my record is not true, but there is one other, not just one, but two that bear record of me, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in this scripture tells you that. See, what we know today about the scripture, the, the, the testification to its validity, it, you need to, you need to, you know, you need to know about the outside stuff. You know, you should learn about, you know, who Erasmus was and wh what the Greek New Testament contain, contained, what the majority text is, what the text... You should study that stuff out. It's not, it's not a bad thing to study, but your faith ultimately rests in the Word of God, right? You follow me? How, how you have to use the Scripture to form your faith. So for the authentication of, the self-authentication of the Scripture, people say, well, that's not fair. You can't prove an argument from the argument itself. It's circular reasoning. To which I say I agree. It, we absolutely circularly reason that the Bible is the Word of God because it, we say the Bible is the Word of God. You follow me? The Bible's the Bible. The Bible is God's Word because the Bible says it's God's Word. The Bible is righteousness because the Bible says it's righteousness. That is sin because the Bible says it's sin. Right? You see how that works? It becomes what? It becomes the source of absolute truth. Today, in this day and age, you are going to witness the biggest abomination that's ever accomplished in the history of American politics, right? You're going to witness it. You're going to watch either you know, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton be elected, okay? And, and those two individuals, I can assure you that neither of them believe in the validity of absolute truth. They don't. They don't. 
they are they are completely 100% postmodern thought subjectivism to the core. That is what is good for some is good for some, what is good for others is good for others, but don't force any beliefs upon the others and we can somehow live in that regard. Well, I can assure you that that doesn't work. It never will work and you're always going to need absolute truth. So when Russ is going through these sermons and he's going through and people are going, "Well, I need to know more. I need to I want to learn about the deep details of every manuscript." Okay, well, we can do that. But is your faith going to rest in that? Right? Or is your faith going to rest in the Word of God? See, what I think people do is they need to get to a point where they, they study that stuff out to the extent that they, they go, okay, I see how that works from an educational perspective, so I'm historically understanding where the Bible came from. But then after that, you don't need to go back to that and keep going back to that and go back to that again and, and keep rehashing that discussion. Right? That discussion gets beat, and you need to go back to the Word of God because at the end of the day, where is the power of God into salvation? It's in, a, it's in a gospel that you can understand, right? So you can hand somebody a Greek New Testament and say, here. Well, if they don't speak Greek, it's not going to do them any good, right? It's not going to help them. So as it says here in Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring glad tidings, preach the gospel. That is our duty and our obligation is to preach. So the, the, the self-authentication is circular reasoning by definition, but circular reasoning is not bad when it's based upon an absolute truth there in the authority of God, right? In his word. Right? You follow me how people are like, well, you can't use, a, can't use a, a circular reasoning argument. It doesn't work that way. Well, in Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 17, we see an example of how many times God himself, through Jesus Christ, testifies to the validity of everything that was previously stated. I think it's pretty cool to look at all the verses that Russ is going through and seeing, okay, you know, he, we're seeing Jesus Christ talk about Jonah, right? So everybody's like, oh, that thing never happened. Uh, he talks about it, and he talks about it specifically. Okay. He talks about as we're in the days of Noah, and he talks about the flood, and he doesn't talk about it as some mythological story. He talks about it as it's an authoritative fact of history that everybody knows, right? Those are the days of Noah. He doesn't have to go into this whole long detail about that. They all know it, right? See, the whole world knew that, and what happens is that as time progresses, the world removes the, the knowledge of God from them more and more and more and more and more. I mean, I don't think you understand how crazy it's gotten. It's only going to get worse. I mean, the more that you say that you're a Christian, it unfortunately carries with it all this baggage. I had one of my guys that works with me tell me the other day, he goes, you know what, I hate being a Christian. And I said, well, elaborate, what do you mean? He goes, I can't stand it, because every time I tell somebody I'm a Christian, it carries with it every piece of baggage of all the crazy denominational systems. And I said, okay. I said, you got your work cut out for you, don't you? And he goes, yeah. And he says, it's just not fair. He says, so many Christians are so ignorant. I just don't understand it. And it's so ridiculous. And you know what I said to him? I said, dude, why are you getting all bent out of shape about this? He goes, because it's just ridiculous. They should all know this. And I said, okay. And I said to him this, I said, imagine Christ coming to the earth and going, you guys have never read any of this. You, you don't know any of this, right? You have no clue what's going on. You're completely lost as to who I am, right? No clue? Okay, that's what I thought. And he kind of was like, okay, I get it. I said, so just the same frustration you feel about the baggage that comes with people who call themselves Christians who are definitely not Christians, we know that. I said the same thing when Christ comes to the earth and he sees all these Jews who claim to be of, of Abraham. And he goes, you know, what? You say you're Abraham's seed? You, you say you're of Jacob? Well, how? Where? When did that happen? What do you know about him? What? Where is your heart, right? And he kind of, you know, kind of, I think for him, for, for the guy who was working with me, he goes, I get it. That's an empathetic, you know, I, I get the empathy portion of it now. I, I see that Christ would relate with me and I relate with Christ about, you no, know, it's the same thing. So in, in, in Matthew 8, here's a good example. Of, of again a quotation he brings right verse 16 when the even was come they brought with him this is matthew 8 16 they brought him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and he healed all that were sick notice why that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness right let's give another example of that turn to the book of uh, uh galatians chapter number three Galatians 3. 
Let me read what he says. I'm going to read this again. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Notice this verse in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, or, or Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Super important thing. Super important. See, when it says he was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. How and why? What took place? The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That verse just right there, you could preach a whole sermon on the chastisement of our peace and what that means. Reading this verse again, Christ has redeemed us. This is Galatians 3.13. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse. For who? Who was he made a curse for? For us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. I mean, think about that just for a second. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. There it is. He's taking with him the whole, the whole, you know, not just the the little, oh, he, he buried, like just we just read in that Matthew verse. You know, he took he took some of our infirmities, right? He Because the devils were cast out. He took our infirmities to bear our sickness. Okay, from like a non-spiritual perspective, makes sense. From just a fleshly perspective, he took it. No, no, he took it to the next level. He bore everything. He hath made him to be what? Sin for us. Are you familiar with that verse? Second Corinthians chapter number five. I think we should turn there because I, I sometimes... Assume that people know these passages and they sometimes do not. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he specifically states there in verse number 21, for he hath made him, notice this, for he hath made him to be sin for us. He said that he, he, he said in, what, what was the verse we just read in Galatians chapter number 3? He took him to be what? He made him to be a curse for us. Notice that. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of law, being made a curse for us. See, this, this aspect is what we consider to be propitiation. You know, that is a great definition, a, a, a great word. You don't hear it that much. It's a stand-in. He took everything that you were to bear, and he took it upon himself. Because the righteousness of God demands a payment. And we have a sermon that is entitled, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the Reconciliation and... Uh, uh, the the retro, I can't think of the word off the top of my head. Uh, penal substitutionary atonement. If you've if you've ever heard of that, and the substitutionary atonement, which comes by way of propitiation, then you should listen to that sermon, which is really important. So in Isaiah chapter fifty three, uh, we'll look at one more verse. Go to John sixteen. Sixteen and verse number two. This is, this is how he works when you're, you're stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And he says, and, they, and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So again, when he says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They thought that they were, they were really doing God service by killing Jesus Christ. Going on, he says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And this, this phrase here, the chastisement of our peace, was upon him. See, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse number 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we have peace through Jesus Christ? In what way do we have peace? See, in order to have peace, you had to first have wrath, right? So how did he take peace? The wrath. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse number 9. He says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, what's that word? Wrath through him. So in other words, the chastisement of the peace that is upon him saves us from the wrath and gives us that peace. He says, for if, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. My mom asked me the other day, she goes, what's that mean? 
she stopped me when I was dropping off the kids the other day. She goes, what does it mean when he says, we were enemies? He says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Well, I said, yeah. I, I explained to her that, that Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet, what does he say? While we were yet sinners, right? Christ died for us. She goes, okay. So I get that, that we were enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. He says, but then how, how is it that much more than being reconciled that we're saved by his life? I said, be, I said well, well, what is his life all about now? He liveth evermore to make intercession in our behalf. His whole life now is our life, right? Because we are dead and our life is hid with Christ, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the whole, the whole concept there. So being reconciled back, that, that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. And we all can be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus by what? By faith, right? So now the practical aspects of that are, are the lifelong journey of understanding what it is to be justified, right? I mean, it's like your whole life, you're just trying to really wrap your head around what it means to be justified. I mean, if you think that you really got justification completely down and you got it, well, great, I'm glad, because that's awesome, because you're going to be really established. But it takes, in my opinion, it takes a long time to really appreciate all, and you just, it's a lifelong appreciation. Why? Because every time you sin, which is on a constant, regular basis, you experience the grace of God, and you experience the justification of God all over again. It's just constant. It's there. You're, you, you're not you're not getting re-justified, you're, you're, appreciating your, you're appreciating your justification. Does that make sense? It's not like you get unjustified and re-justified, and, oh, I sinned this time, let me try to repent, and then I'll get, I'll get re-justified. No, that's not how it works. So in verse number six, he says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. This is a great passage because Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost. And who did he come to seek and to save? The lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? Very clear, very explicitly states that. All we like sheep have gone astray. How did they go astray? Why did they go astray? Well, Jeremiah chapter 23 goes in great detail about how the pastors scattered the flock, right? And how God, when they did not listen and obey the law, they were struck with the curse and they were scattered, right? Smite the shepherd, scatter the sheep. We're familiar with that, that passage and that understanding. So this is all we like sheep have gone astray. The, the astray that they've done is really summarized quite well in the book of Romans and read with me over here in chapter number uh, one. If you'd like to see an example of going after your own way, here it is. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Listing everything there. So when he says, all we like sheep have gone astray, it's true. He says, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the own way is what, what Proverbs says. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. And what is it? And the end thereof are the ways of what? Of death. See, everybody you walk to and talk to has a religion. They do. Oh, I'm not religious. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, I don't believe in religion. Yeah, you're religious. Why do you do anything good? Why do you have any morality in you? Well, uh, you know, what is your attempt to please some higher power? Well, I don't have a higher power. Are you the higher power? You can get into this whole big, long debate with individuals, but everybody has a way that they go, okay? And when you get down to it, you go, look, what at the end of the day do you really believe in why with these people? It's amazing to me to see how many of my friends who are Christians are like, killery, that's what they call her, you know, killery, which is pretty funny. And they get so like, like defensive about this whole election. I just go, guys, why are you wasting your time? <laughs> okay. And then they like, to, I like it when they think that somehow Trump is better than, than, than Hillary or like, we just need to vote for Gary Johnson. Like, look, dude, okay, okay. it doesn't matter. You don't put those people in there. You don't vote for them. 
voting doesn't work and people are like oh i can't believe you're gonna say it you're gonna tell me that democracy doesn't matter yeah I'll, i will i'll tell you it doesn't matter because you don't vote you, you think you vote you think that matters you think you actually have to elect people you think you get to make change what planet do you live on what country do you think you're really in okay it's an illusion of choice you go out there you place your little ballot in a little computer dude we've just scratched the surface of what's going to come and i really don't think people understand this is the most monumental change in our election that i've ever been a part of in my in my history everybody's like obama's going to kill everything well yeah we pay a little bit more in uh in health insurance right uh, we've had we've added some more people to the supreme court who are even more immoral and ethical and, and do illegal things okay how are you why, why are people surprised that unregenerate people make bad decisions <laughs> right I mean, why do people get so surprised when unregenerate people do things that are inherently sinful? Well, I'm not surprised. Not at all. Nor am I concerned about the situation. Okay? There's going to be a time, and I think it's going to be pretty soon, that you're going to reach that point that he talks about in, in the book of Philippians. That he's given him a name that is above every name. And so that, that name, the more you name and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, it's going to get, it's going to get nasty. It's going to get bad. See, fundamentalism at its core is almost gone. It's almost dissipated. There's very few left. And give it another generation cycle, gone. Gone. They're, they're, you think the kids of today have morality? They're not being taught it. Definitely not in school. Okay? So let's look at these verses a little bit more. All really sheep have gone astray. have turned everyone to his own way. In your own ways, it says, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. And it's very clear that that deserves the punishment. So what he says here is the Lord hath laid on him, that is on Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Notice this next verse, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. If I start to take your arm and I bend it behind your back and I pin my knee in the back of your neck, what are you going to do? Probably going to scream, Right? You're probably going to tell me to stop it, right? If I'm carrying a really heavy cross up to Golgotha to be crucified, right? You think I'm going to be mumbling and complaining and screaming out in pain? Probably. Notice what it says here. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. If you've ever watched the slaughter of a lamb, really even the slaughter of a cow, they have no clue what's going on. They're so dumb, they just walk right in. Ooh, walk right in. The sheep, ah, they walk right in. And they a lot of times they use those, you've seen them with the bang sticks. They just go, I mean, they have a line. <laughs> they literally go, dink. They have the little bang stick, you know, puts a slug right into the back of their neck or in their brain. Dink. They fall over. They whip them around. They hang them up. I don't know if you've ever seen this. They hang them up. They cut their neck. They bleed them out. They set them down the line, they do the next one, dink, grab them by the, the legs, hang them up, slit their neck, bleed them out, and there's just the amount of blood that comes and just pours in, right? You know the amount of blood that that is was shed by Jesus Christ is a picture of all of the other sacrifices that were ever committed. All of that blood was not even remotely close to, to take one tiny sin away. You follow me? Not just one, the smallest little tiny sin. Didn't take a single one of those away, right? The shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, right? Doesn't ever say you get the forgiveness of sins. Because the bull, blood of bulls and goats can never do what? Can never take away sin. Going on, he says, He opened not his mouth, and he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, that dumb means doesn't speak, just goes right through. He says, so he opened not his mouth. Remember when they questioned him? Who do, they, who, do you, who do you say you are? Who are you? Don't you know I have the power to kill you? And what does he say? You don't have any power. <laughs> the power you have is the power that I give you. Look, I could call 10,000 angels right now and make this thing all stop. But in obedience to the Father and to the prophetic program, I'm going to continue on with it. No man can take my life from me. Remember that? I lay it down. He says, He was taken from prison and from judgment. There's another verse that he says, Who shall declare his generation? 
That's the same verse as verse 1. Who should declare his generation? In verse verse 53, 1, who hath believed our report? It's all the same thing. He says that in, in the book of Acts. Um, I, 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 I don't know where it is off the top of my head. I could find the verse. But he says, who, hath, who shall declare his generation? He specific, Peter specifically quotes that verse. Who shall declare his generation? That, in other words, he means, who's going to talk about when Jesus Christ is dead and raised again? Who's going to talk about that generation? What happens during that generation? I'll tell you that there's very few people who even talk about that generation. Who's going to declare their generation? Very few people. Who can tell you really about what happened in the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? I, I mean, I think you, you think I might be just harsh on Christians, but go talk to them and ask them about justification. Ask them about the mechanics of why they are a believer. They can't tell you anything. See, he was taken from prison and from judgment. He didn't get a fair, fair trial, right? Pontius Pilate washes his hands. You ever read that verse in Matthew chapter 27? Look at Matthew chapter 27. Look what he says here. Matthew 27 and verse 24. No, no, read verse 22. No, read verse 21. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto him, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And this next verse, I, I promise you, I, 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 just, I just stumbled upon this verse recently and really understood what it meant. Look what he says. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. You read the end of the book of Malachi and there it is. right? When he tries to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children, the children of the fathers, to make the people prepare for the Lord, they try to gather those sheep and they all just say, We don't want it. All we like sheep have gone astray and we want to stay astray. Because we don't want you at all. We don't want you to be our Messiah. We won't have you reign over us. We do not want anything to do with you. Crucify him. They pick a murderer over the just Christ, right? What does that show you? That shows you the impact and the effective work of Satan in people's lives, right? I was talking to Frank today. I said, Frank, what do you think Satan's doing today? Because what do you mean? Who do you think he's working with? Right? I mean, what do you think he does? What do you think his goal and his desire is? I said, is he going over to Island's Adventure to ride the new ride this week? No. I don't care about that. What's he trying to do? Well, he knows about his fate. And he knows about what's coming. So his goal is to impact those individuals who have the greatest influence on the most amount of people. Who would those people be? You know, and Frank says, well, do you think they have secret round meeting round meetings with Satan? I'm like, look, do you don't think anybody in this world talks to Satan? Well, I can assure you that they do. Sure, you plenty of them do. Plenty of high people in high places speak to Satan and talk to him on a regular basis. And what's even crazier about the whole situation people think is crazy is if you read the verses, and we can get into these, when, they, when, when, Satan, when Christ finally casts Satan down, all of the nations look at him when they're all cast in the lake of fire with him, and they go, hold on, it was you? You were the one that stood weak in the nations? I thought you were so powerful. How do you have no power against God? What's his response? Nothing. He's got nothing to say. Because God explicitly tells him that, you know, in the day you thought you were going to be like God, your fate was sealed. See, these verses, especially this one here in verse 25, where he says, then answer all the people, his blood be on us and on our children. See, what's funny is they did get the blood of Christ on them. They got it in two different ways, right? They can continue to keep the blood of Christ on them, right? Ye with wicked hands have you crucified and slain, remember as Peter says. You can have that upon you. Or you can much more now, now than being justified by his blood, right? We shall be saved by wrath through him. It's kind of a play on words. They can have the blood of Christ on them. They can have that blood totally take care of all of their sin. Or they can keep the blood of Christ on them and be, be guilty, of the death of Christ. Guilty 100% of crucifying Jesus Christ. I mean, how Peter says it, ye with wicked hands have crucified and slain the coming of the just one who was before you. You have no excuse. You killed him. The prince of glory. I mean, he, he lays it out there to those guys. So even through all of that, 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? It says, for he was cut off of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. See, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21, it says, He shall save his people. You know that verse? Matthew 1, 21. Matthew 1 and verse 21. And he shall bring forth his son, and I shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Well, how does he save his people from his sins? Well, we know how the, we know how the justification process now works through Paul. He explained that. Without Romans, you're going to have a real tough time explaining that, you know? Without the book Hebrews, you're going to go, what now? How did that all work out? Think about it. If you didn't have Romans and Hebrews and you try to explain this whole thing, it's going to be pretty difficult to do. He goes on to say, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's Matthew twenty six twenty eight. We're going to stop here in about two minutes and we're going to pick up next week. But he says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And notice this verse, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. See, we're going to stop with one other verse, turn to Matthew chapter 20 and 28, okay? This verse is some verse that people just get so hung up on. They can't handle this verse because they go, I don't understand it. It says he justifies many. It says he bears the sin of many. Well, technically he bears the sin of all, okay? But technically he only bears the sin of many. You follow me? He's the savior of all men, especially those that what? That believe. See, you don't get to experience the bearing of the sin of God upon Jesus Christ unless you what? Believe the gospel. So when he says he bears the sin of many, that's a true statement. See, many is subsumed in the greater picture of all, right? You follow me? So if I have many here, this is a group of many, and then I have another, I have a group of many that's 50 people, and then I have another 100 people that are over here, and I say, okay, the many, they're all going to get to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Okay, great. Sounds awesome. If I say, okay, everybody goes to Chuck E. Cheese, it includes the many, right? You follow me? So all encompasses many. The, the verse in Matthew chapter 20 and 28 will qu close with this. Christ himself quotes the prophet Isaiah, and he makes it very clear. Tw read, read 20 and verse number uh, 23. He says this. And, uh, and he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to him whom is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as a son of man came not to be ministered to, notice this, but to minister. And to give his life a ransom for what? Give his life a ransom for many. See, I don't have a huge problem with these verses because he does only give his life a ransom for many. But he does give his life a ransom for all, as Paul says, to be testified in due time. Okay, How does he do that? Well, see, to the Jew, at this point in time, they think nothing about the covenants of Jesus Christ as the, and the promise of Jesus Christ as it relates to the Gentile. Right? How would they get that? Ephesians 2 explicitly states that the Gentiles are without hope. They're strangers. They're aliens from the covenants of promise. Right? They don't, they don't get that. And so what God is going to do through progressive revelation is explain how, through Israel's fall, while none believed his report, while none wanted to declare his generation, while none wanted to believe, God chose the Apostle Paul, lifted him up, gave him grace, and through their fall, what? Salvation has come to the ends of the earth. And that God says, look, this goes out to all.
and he's a savior of all men, especially those that believe. And it's upon all, it's unto all, and upon all them that what? Believe. See, it's unto all, but it's upon all them that believe. So that's the many. You follow me? Many get justified. And really, there's few that really get justified in the grand scope of things. Many do, but there's few that be saved. So we'll pick up next week. We'll talk a little bit more about this, and then we'll talk about some of the verses that uh, that Todd wanted to get into. All right, let's close with a prayer. Dear God, again.